good morning and welcome to Stevens Creek Church. We're so glad that you're here today. What a beautiful day to be in church. I'd like to welcome all those in our Grovetown campus. I'd like to welcome those in our South Campus, those watching online and on demand. Hey, let me say something to those watching online. Let me, I want to encourage you to come to church this Christmas season. I'm telling you, if you'll do that at one of our campuses, you'll meet some of the finest people in all of Augusta, Georgia. I can assure you of that for sure. So it's Christmas season. How many of you have already started your Christmas shopping? Anybody here? Oh, yeah, a number of you. Some of you got to get to work now. Now, early in our, our marriage, I thought that shopping would be something that Patty and I would enjoy doing together. And so that would be like one of those events. Now, at that time, I didn't realize that men shop differently than women, right? Because when I thought about shopping, I thought about making a list and then going to the store and checking off every, I'm talking about getting it done. I mean, I could take that whole list and have it done by noon on Saturday. And so I was all about uh, being efficient, being really efficient in the, in the process. Now, Patty is much different. Now, Patty, her shopping is all about the experience. She wants to walk down every aisle. She wants to touch. She wants to feel the fabrics. She wants to talk about it. She wants to talk to other people about it. And then she's going to decide to buy it. And so after a few shopping trips together, Patty realized that we had different approaches, and she uninvited me to go shopping with her. (laughs) So what's your shopping style? Do you like to be efficient, or do you like the experience? Turn to the person beside you and tell them if you're like me or if you're like Patty. But did you hear about the two men that opted to go sailing instead of Christmas shopping with their wives? Yeah, two men opted to go sailing on the lake instead of going Christmas shopping with their their wives. And while they were out on the lake, they got caught in this violent storm. It was such a violent storm that the boat capsized. And there they are in the freezing waters, holding on to the overturned boat, floating towards shore. It was miserable out there. And then one looked at the other and said, you know what? This is better than Christmas shopping. (laughs) Well, today we're starting a brand new series called The Gift. And we're going to look at three different gifts that the wise men gave Jesus. Now, some of you may not know the story, but when Jesus was born of a virgin, there were wise men, or some people call the magi, who were very wealthy, very educated Gentiles that traveled a long way to, to come uh, to see Jesus and to worship him. The wise men, they were celebrities of their day. I mean, uh, they were endowed with great minds and great resources and great opportunities. So today we're going to see Christmas through their eyes. So we're going to open up the Bible and turn to Matthew chapter 2, and we're going to read the wise men's story of Christmas. Matthew chapter 2. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of of Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem. They came to Jerusalem and asked, where's the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and we have come to worship him. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared, and he sent them to Bethlehem, and he said, go and make a careful search for the child, and as soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star that they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and they worshiped. 
Then they opened their treasures and they presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, it's interesting as we read this story that, and compare this to the Luke story, we start to see that the, the wise men were not there on Christmas Eve. Oftentimes, we see the nativity set at grandma's house, and we see the wise men and the shepherds, and we see the angels and the farm animals and, and Joseph and Mary and Jesus and so forth. But realistically, the wise men were not there because you notice in the verse here that Jesus was no longer in a stable. He was no longer in a manger, but he was in a house. We also see that Jesus was no longer called a baby, but he was called a child, a young child. Some traditions say it took upwards to two years on the search for the wise men to actually find Jesus. Now, we look at this story and we think, well, of course, there are three wise men because there are three wise men in our nativity set. But tradition tells me that more than likely, they traveled in large groups of people. And so it could be a a large entourage. We say that there were three wise men because there were three gifts. But it could be even more people than that that came. We know they came from the east, which... uh, is known as the Orient. There are a lot of things we know about the wise men, but there are a lot of things that we simply do not know. But here's what we do know. The wise men opened their treasures and they presented Jesus with three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, why would they bow down and present these extravagant gifts to a baby? I don't know about you, but when uh, Patty and I had kids, and when they were born, nobody brought us gold, frankincense, and myrrh, but they did bring us some diapers and some onesies and some pacifiers. But the wise men gave gold, frankincense, and myrrh, and it's important for us to understand the significance behind these events, uh, these gifts. So what do we know about them? We know this, and this is the big idea for the series. Every gift tells a story. Every gift tells a story. Each gift has significance. Each gift served a practical purpose, but it also conveyed a prophetic message. And so today, I'm going to focus on the gift of gold. We're going to look at the gift of gold. Gold is the symbol for royalty. And throughout history, because of the scarcity and the value of gold, gold has been known as a gift that was fit for a king. Even the wise men says, uh, where's the newborn king? Now, when we think about king, different images come to our minds. I mean, if the kids are watching a movie and there's an animal in the movie named Simba, we know that they're watching the Lion King. That's right. And we know that if we go through a drive through and we order a Whopper that you're dining at Hold the pickles, hold the lettuce, special orders won't upset us. (laughs) Those folks that are laughing are old. (laughs) Now, you know that if, if you are reading a scary novel, it may be written by Stephen King. But when we talk about Jesus as king, we're talking about a king like no other. The Jews expected their king to be born surrounded by wealth and surrounded by luxury. They expected him to be born in a crib with with purple linen, maybe even wearing a Gucci onesie or something. I don't know. But nobody expected a king to be born in poverty in a smelly animal stable in Bethlehem. No one could have predicted that the king of glory, the son of God, would befriend prostitutes and touch lepers and stand up for the oppressed. They had never imagined a king that would choose uneducated fishermen and tax collectors and rebellious troublemakers to be his disciples. And no one imagined that an innocent king would be beaten and whipped and scourged and tortured as a suffering servant on a cross. 
And when he breathed his last breath, no one expected this king to rise from the dead. But three days later, when the women went to the tomb, the stone was rolled away and his body was not there because he had risen. And today, King Jesus sits on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. And one day, as hard as it is for us to imagine, he will return to this earth as a conquering king in victory. And the Apostle Paul describes it just like this. At just the right time, Christ will be revealed from heaven by the blessed and only Almighty God, the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords. So who is this king that the wise men bowed down and worshiped? He is the king of glory. He is the king of the ages. He is the king of righteousness. He is the king that opened up the blinded eyes. He is the king that unstopped the deaf ears. He is the king that gave hope uh, to the hurting. And he released the captives to freedom. Uh, The devil could not stop him. Death could not defeat him. The grave could not hold him. He is the son of God. He's the savior of the world. And he truly is the king of all kings and the Lord of all lords. So what's our response to this? Well, let's look and see how the wise men responded. How did the wise men respond? They bowed down. And they worshiped. They bowed down and they worshiped. When we bow down, we physically show humility and respect. When we bow down, we are saying, I acknowledge your authority and I submit to you. I acknowledge your authority and I submit to you. The wise men bowed down and surrendered to Jesus as king. That's the significance of giving him gold. Gold was a gift that was fit for a king. They are saying with this gift that, Jesus, you are the king. We often talk about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is wherever Jesus is king. If he is king in your heart, then the kingdom of God is within you. If he is king in heaven, then the kingdom of God is in heaven. Once again, the kingdom of God is wherever Jesus is king. It is wherever he rules and he reigns. That's why Jesus taught his disciples to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus is encouraging us teaching us to pray for God's kingdom to come and his will to be done. Why is that? Because God's will is not always done on this earth. A lot of times you hear people say something when maybe something bad happens and they'll just try to say something to to make, give it understanding. And they say, well, it must've been God's will. No, it's not. God's will is not evil. Hear that. God's will is never evil. God's will is not sinfulness. God's will is not people making bad decisions. People making bad decisions, that could be my will, maybe your will, but it's not God's will. God's will is not always done on this earth. That's why we pray, oh God, may your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's why we pray that prayer. The wise men acknowledge that Jesus is king. They bow down. They surrender. Now, listen to me. I believe that every one of us can find peace by surrendering to Jesus today in four ways. Every one of us can find peace by surrendering to Jesus today in four ways. First of all, surrendering to Jesus means letting go of control. Surrendering to Jesus means letting go of control. Every day you have to decide who's going to be in control of your life. You or God. Every day. You have to decide who's going to be in control of your life. You or God. Every day it's a battle. Every day it's a battle. 
there are things in your life that you don't want to give up control over. If you're like me, you want to control it. You want to be the boss over that situation. And there are verses in the Bible that you would embrace, and then there's another group of verses in the Bible that you would love to take an exacto knife and cut them out because you just don't want to even read those verses. But if we want peace in our lives, we've got to submit, we've got to surrender. And that starts with letting God be God. It starts with surrender. The strongest position that you can be in is the position of complete surrender. The Bible says in Psalm chapter 46 and verse 10, he said, be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God and I will be exalted among the nations and I will be exalted in the earth. When we see the words be still, that phrase in the original language, in the Hebrew language, literally means to let go. It literally means to calm down, to relax, to lighten up, to let go. But the truth is we don't like the word surrender. When we think of surrender, we think about waving a white flag saying, I give up, I forfeit, I lose, I submit. And we struggle with that. I believe that the number one reason that you live under stress is because you are in conflict with God. You're trying to do things that only God can do. And I can speak as an authority on this because this is what I struggle with. We want to keep our hands on it. We want to control it. We want to control uh, our families. We want to control our work environment. And every time we jump in to control it, we edge God out of the situation and say, I've got this. Think about the word edge God out, E-G-O. That's your ego. When your ego comes to the forefront, you're edging God out out of the situation. He is the king. He's in charge. And if you want peace, you've got to surrender yourself to him and let God direct your steps. The wise men bowed down. They surrendered. Here's the second thing. Surrendering to Jesus means learning to be content. Learning to be content. Have you ever heard of the serenity prayer? Many of you have. You often learn this in 12-step programs. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. If I'm going to be content, I need to accept the things that I cannot change. If you can change something, then go do it. If you can change something, and if you can make something better, what are you waiting on? Go do it. But there are some things that you just can't. You just can't change, and you've got to come to the place where you learn to accept those things. And if you don't learn to accept it, you're going to be stressed out, you're going to be worried, you're going to be angry, and you're going to be really upset, and you're going to have resentment, and all of that's just not going to work. All of that's not going to bring peace to your life. There's really only one thing that works in that situation and um, with those things that you can't change, and that is acceptance, that you learn to be content. Paul understood this. The Apostle Paul, who wrote probably one-fifth of the New Testament, He wrote these words, Philippians chapter 4. He said, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or living in want. I can do 
all things through him who gives me the strength. Now we read these and we use these verses often. But what do we know about this? We know that when Paul wrote these words, he was in a prison cell in Rome. And at this point, he was chained to a Roman soldier in a dark prison. So I believe he knows what he's talking about. And you notice the word learned here. Contentment is a learned experience. You have to learn it. And one of the reasons people struggle with contentment is because they're always looking for an explanation of why did this happen? Why? God doesn't always tell us why things happen. He wants us to learn how to trust him. Here's what I've learned. That when you're going through pain and you're going through difficulty, you don't need God's explanation. You need God's presence. You need God's presence to come and to bring uh, peace on you. You need his presence to fill the room. You need to sense that there is a power greater than yourself. And that power is present in the moment of your suffering. In the moment of your pain. In the moment of your difficulty that God is with you. You need God's presence. How do you get to God's presence? You get to God's presence through praise and worship. Praise, first of all, that you begin to praise him. And you can praise him from afar. But here's what happens. As you begin to praise and you begin to lift up his name, you start to enter into his presence and you enter into a holy of holies where you sense God and who he is and you feel his presence and you worship him. Look, that's why being in church is so important. Because there's something special about joining with your church family. There's something special about being in that Grovetown campus or in that South campus, here in the Augusta campus, and you're here with other people, and you start to lift up praise. And as you start to lift up praise, what happens? The presence of the Lord comes and lives in those praises, and that we start to sense that this is more than just a classroom, that this is more than just a teaching session, but this is a place where we sense that God is here. There's something powerful about that. And we need that corporate experience together. But not only that, you need your daily quiet time. It's important during a daily quiet time that you refocus your attention away from yourself and onto the Lord. There's something about that. That's why um, a quiet time is important. That's why listening to encouraging music is important too. It starts to feed your spirit. Listening and encouraging music along the way. That's why I love Christmas music because Christmas music, you'll hear that all across the community during the season. I've been in uh, retail stores and hear that, that line, now fall on your knees. And I think about, wow, this, we're at the mall and they're playing that. There's something powerful about music that lifts up the soul. And so I encourage you to listen to that. Notice what the wise men did. And when they came into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and they worshiped. I'm going to talk about worship more next week. Here's the third thing. Surrendering to Jesus means laying down my plans. Laying down my plans letting go of our plans and letting God have his way in every aspect of our lives. We look at this gift of gold here that the wise men brought, and they were saying that, Jesus, you're the king, and we we submit to your authority. We're laying down our plans and say, you lead us and guide us and direct us. And this is so hard for me sometimes because I have a plan that I thought about, that I worked on, that I want to see happened. And 
in, there are times when God has something completely different. And it's like I have my plans and I go after it, but it's like a closed door. It's a closed door. I knock on that door. I push on that door. I try to make it happen, but it is a closed door because God has another plan. Oftentimes, God is working behind the scenes in your life, leading you and guiding you to the place that he wants you to be. I want you to hear the word of the Lord. I want you to hear these scriptures, these verses, as I read them over you. Jeremiah 29 and verse 11. For I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all of your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back from captivity. Oftentimes, God allows problems to develop in our lives so that he can use those problems to redirect us. The problems are like airplanes. They come and they land in our lives and then they take off and leave. As they're taking off and leaving, there's a good possibility another problem is landing in our lives. You've either just come out of a problem or you're about to go into a problem or you're stuck in a problem right now. That's just life. That's how it is. Why don't our plans work out? Or why do I have so many problems? That's probably a better question. Because you've heard people say that. Why? Why do I suffer so much? Why do I have so many problems? I don't know the answer to that. But I do know some things that maybe could provide some insight. First of all, we have problems because we make bad decisions. You make bad choices, and I do too. We, get, we don't use our time wisely. We get rushed. We get pressured. Uh, We have deadlines that are just basically impossible to meet. Uh, We don't use our money wisely. We don't eat right. We make all kind of bad decisions. And when we do that, we cannot blame God for that. Those are decisions that you have made and I've made. And so a lot of problems in our lives or in this world are, are there simply because we made bad decisions. Okay? Here's another reason there are problems. The second reason there's problems is that you have an enemy. You have a spiritual enemy, and his name is Satan. He is the devil. He is real, and he wants to defeat you. Jesus said, Satan comes not but to steal, kill, and destroy. So you have this enemy that's warring against you. And then the third reason we have problems is that we live in a broken world. We live in a sin-cursed world. Our world is not perfect. Our world will never be perfect on this side. Everything in this planet is broken. Nothing works right. Your body doesn't work right all the time. Your relationships don't work right all the time. The economy does not work right all the time. The weather does not work right all the time. Nothing works right all the time because we live in a broken world. There's coming a new heaven and a new earth. And in the meantime, we've got to be good stewards of our world. But I'm telling you, you can spend billions and trillions of dollars on any type of green energy that you want. And you're not going to stop that this world is decaying and that there's a new world coming. I need to move on off of that. I could camp there a while. (laughs) Camp there a while. Stewardship is key. We've got to be better stewards of what we do. And um, you've got to be good stewards of money. You hear that, Washington? Good stewards of tax money. Here's the fourth and final one. 
Surrendering to Jesus means leaving the future. Hey, God, I'm, my future's in your hands. Leaving the future to God. I'm not going to try to live in the future. I'm going to live today. I'm going to embrace today, one day at a time. And no matter what's going on, I'm going to live for the Lord. I'm going to trust him. I'm going to put my confidence that he is guiding me. Listen to the words of Proverbs chapter 3. When it says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all of your ways, submit to him. In all of your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. We've got to trust. What does that mean? That I'm going to acknowledge God in every area of my life in my spiritual life, in my family life. I'm going to acknowledge him. I'm going to put him first. I'm going to trust him in my career. I'm going to trust him in, in uh, my friendships, in my finances, in my addictions, in my secrets. I'm going to say, God, I trust you to lead me. I'm going to surrender these things to you. God, take my life. I surrender this. So let me ask you a question. Are there any parts of your life that you have not surrendered to the Lord? Are there any parts of your life that you have not surrendered? How about your family? Give it over to the Lord. But you say, Marty, I'm going through a terrible divorce. Give it over to the Lord. You be the person that God's called you to be. What area of your life is not surrendered? That you're holding up a white flag and say, God, I'm giving it over to you. I'm surrendering it. Let your kingdom come and let your will be done on earth, in my life as it is in heaven. There are often times that, that I pray and I, and I use this phrase over and over, God, don't let anybody but Jesus run my life. Don't let anybody but Jesus run my life. I pray that over my, my family, and I, I call them out by name. And I say, God, don't let anybody but Jesus run my family. I pray over you, the church, this church, and this congregation. God, don't let anybody but Jesus run this congregation. I want Jesus to be Lord in our lives. I want Jesus to be king in this place. I've already started thinking that in about five weeks from now, we start 21 days of prayer. That we want to start at a place in the new year to say, God, get the junk out of our lives. And God, let us be focused on the power of the Holy Spirit and let us receive what you have for us. But you know what? We don't have to wait till 21 days of prayer. That can start right now. That this can be the moment. This can be the moment that you surrender this, this thing in going on. And I don't know what that thing is for you. Maybe it's anger. Maybe it's resentment. Maybe it's lack of forgiveness. Maybe it's an addiction. God, I'm giving it over to you. Jesus, I surrender. I surrender. Do you have any areas that you need to surrender? Today is your day. Let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray over Stevens Creek Church. I pray that your presence would be strong in our church today. And as people all across this room start to, to call out things that they need help with, God, we are surrendering these problems. We're surrendering this pain. We're surrendering this situation to you. And we're praying a simple prayer that says, help me. God, will you help me today? Say that. Say, God, will you help me today? God, we're crying out that you would help us. And Lord, we open up our hearts and lives and we receive what you have for us. With the heads still bowed, there may be some of you that you've never made a decision to follow Jesus. If that's you, I want to lead you in this prayer. Pray 
something like this. Say, Jesus, come into my heart and save me. Say, Jesus, save me. Pray this prayer. Say, Jesus, make me into the kind of person that you would have me to be. I give you my life. I give you my past, and I trust you with my future. God, I'm asking you to fill me. Say that. Say, God, I'm asking you to fill me with your Holy Spirit. And I receive what you have. Head still bowed. How many of you prayed that prayer with me today? And you will slip up your hand and say, Marty, that's me. All across this room, yes, yes, yes. Father, let your peace rest upon the families of this church. God, fill us with your spirit. We receive what you have for us in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen, amen, and amen. God bless you today.